Now we are continuing on with the Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 2 Plot Leak. Now these plot leaks are likely a load of Hawk Tui, but nonetheless they are very entertaining. So let's go ahead and continue with Part 2. By the time this video goes up, you still have time to enter the contest. It will only be a few hours, but make sure you follow that Gleam.io link down below. Pause this video and make sure you enter that contest every single way possible. Now the last time we were mentioning these plot leaks, we left off with everyone in Winterfell waiting for Daenerys' arrival. So let's pick off right back there. In Winterfell, everyone is standing in the courtyard of Winterfell preparing for the gates to be opened. Lyanna Mormont and Jan Royce are angry about Sansa's refusal to accept the crown and her order to meet Daenerys in the courtyard. However, Drogon and Rhaegal are flying above Winterfell and the entire castle has been cowed in fear. Arya holds her blade tightly and Bran tells her she won't use it on Daenerys. She can't. They need her. Sansa and Arya are surprised by this. Arya doesn't like the idea of someone forcing Jon to do anything or the North. They had enough of that with the Lannisters. She mentions Tyrion, but Sansa tells Arya he is kind, and perhaps Daenerys Targaryen isn't so bad if she has come to help them save the North. Arya argues that, she doesn't believe that, and if she does, she's stupid. Daenerys just wants the Northern Army to march south. Sansa corrects her, they have the North and the Vale, and that gives them more power if they negotiate, rather than are forced to surrender after battle. Lyanna asks if this negotiation is, you know, a negotiation or a surrender, but Sansa isn't able to answer her. The gates open, Daenerys rides in with Jon right behind her. Jon smiles when he sees Arya and Bran, but he is unable to reunite with them as Daenerys is introduced. Okay, first of all, ah, uh, let's just continue on. However, nobody bows when Missandei declares all of Daenerys' title, which Lyanna rolls her eyes to. <laughs> Daenerys moves to criticize them, but Jor argues that the storm they rode through might have made it possible for them to hear the news. Impossible to hear the news. Sansa steps forward, nervous and asks why she is there and why she calls herself Queen of the North as well as the South. Sansa is pretending not to have heard the news in order to save Winterfell's Daenerys' possible wrath with dragons above them. Daenerys says that Jon has bent the knee. Lyanna and Lord Glover argue that it was not his to give. Lyanna steps forward and states that the last time the North was ruled over by a family which murdered Starks, meaning the Boltons, they went to war, both against the Lannisters, which stand here now, and the Targaryens through the Daenerys. Jorah steps forward. Lyanna is displeased with Jorah and pretends to not know who he is, for no Mormont would stand for a Targaryen. Things are getting heated. Sansa asks if that is true to Jon. She looks very sad. The script says that Jon looks ashamed before he answers yes. The dragons shriek again and Sansa blinks uncomfortable. She takes a breath. Ghost parts his way through the crowd and comes to stand in front of Sansa, Arya, and Bran. He sees Jon and howls. This frightens Daenerys and the others, but not Jon, Davos, and Tyrion. Sansa holds the scruff of Ghost's neck and after a hard look from Lyanna, Glover and Royce, and then a determined look from Arya and a vacant look from Bran, invites Daenerys into the castle to have bread and salt. Okay, so there are so many things wrong with that paragraph I just read. But, uh, yeah, let's let's go into it. So I think what the person who wrote this plot leak was going for is a very intense arrival with Daenerys. You know, kind of like what Game of Thrones is famous for. Like, sometimes the best of friends have one of the worst introductions. You know, that is definitely a common theme in Game of Thrones. But the fact that Daenerys would just be, you know, sort of pompous like they're leading her to believe, I doubt that. Her and Jon just had boat sex, so if anything, you're going to be close. And I doubt she's going to be so uppity queen with everyone in Winterfell. She's going to be more like, oh... We're kind of family now, you know, me and John are eventually going to get married, maybe I should try to get on these people's good sides. Having my dragons, who by the way, according to the episode 1 plot leak, I lost control over, I'm going to have these dragons fly for Winterfell and scare the shit out of everyone without letting them know, hey, I'm here to help you. That's just not going to happen, it's not going to go down like that. There's no way that Daenerys is going to go and arrive in Winterfell on rocks and be like, play sort of this like icy queen role, it's not going to happen. Um, as far as Lyanna rolling her eyes at... Daenerys' title, I could totally see that happening, um, Daenerys does have a long list of titles, and we know that people in the north are not as formal as they are in the south, and not as formal as Daenerys is, is used to, you know, Jon Snow didn't bow to her, and he, he eventually did, yes I know, but he technically never got down and bent the knee and was like, yeah, you're my queen, you're my queen, blah blah blah, you know what I mean, that never happened, so I, I, I don't think that was a little bit of taste of how the North is for Daenerys. I don't think she's going to go up there expecting everyone to be complete 180 of how Jon was in the Dragonstone Keep. When Jon came with 13 people and she had her entire army on Dragonstone with all three dragons. There's no way that, you know, she's going to expect the North to just bend to her will like that. Um, 
you know, it is possible that the Dragons are going to fly over Winterfell. I don't think it's going to be used as kind of like an intimidation tactic like this, you know, this part of the plot leak is claiming. Um, I'm excited to see Ghost. I definitely think Ghost is going to be showing up, uh, if not episode one, episode two. Um, I don't think that he's going to howl at John. I think he's going to go and immediately rush up to John and go and greet him. And that reminds me of the part where they said that John isn't able to go up and greet Arya and Bran. No! I don't think these formalities are going to be that much of a thing or a presence in Game of Thrones Season 8. We just don't have time for it. Like, yes, we have time for clever introductions and all this crap, but I honestly think it's going to be more so Sansa will be in the Winterfell, like, in the head chamber where they have all of the, you know, the King of the North meeting and stuff. That's where they're going to be at. That's when Daenerys is going to show up. I think it's going to be a bit of revolt reversal. We saw how Jon showed up with her. She's in the Dragonstone throne room. I think it's going to be something similar to that. Like, they'll be, you know, not necessarily in the Winterfell throne room, but just in the Winterfell, like, meeting room. Sansa, Bran, and Arya will be up at the table. You know, maybe Ghost is present in that scene. And then Daenerys shows up. And I think, honestly, Jon should be the one who comes in and gives her titles because no one knows who the hell Missande is. So it's not as, you know, effective if you have someone who no one in the North cares or knows delivering these titles to introduce this woman who's here to either help you or murder you. You know, it's just not going to go down like that. But you guys let me know what you think about, you know, that part of uh, episode two of Game of Thrones season eight according to this plot leak. Okay, so continuing on with this next part, we have Theon and Euron in Volantis. So, Theon's point of view in Volantis. Theon's ship is searching for Euron's near to Volantis. They are still bothered by what happened in Bravos, and Theon says he isn't sure they'll fight for Yara if it looks like Euron controls the sea. One of the Ironborn argues that it might be too late to find him. Euron isn't going to the Iron Islands. Theon asks why he would do that. The Ironborn man asks why he would give... Why would he would have gone to Bravos and then Volantis? There's something they don't know happening. Theon says he doesn't care. The only thing he cares about is rescuing Yara. They arrive in Volantis, and the Ironborn says that he sees the Golden Company, the largest group of sellswords, is in the port. This is from Euron's point of view in Volantis. Euron boards a ship owned by the Golden Company. He meets with Harry Strickland and asks to buy their service in a fight for the Iron Throne. Strickland laughs at this and calls Euron mad due to his reputation and that he is too poor to afford them. Euron says he has come with a loan backed by the Iron Bank. Strickland argues that they won't fight for a war that cannot be won. Euron is allied with Cersei who is fighting the Dragon Queen. Strickland laughs at this and says that in Essos, Daenerys Targaryen is seen as the Chosen by the Lord of Light. She is dragons. Euron never said he wasn't he was fighting for Cersei. He plans to take King's Landing and then give it to Daenerys through marriage. Strickland stops for a moment and reminisces about the Golden Company's history. It was founded after they lost the Blackfire Rebellion. They followed Targaryen pretenders until there were none left. But things have changed now. Daenerys Targaryen is the breaker of chains and her existence threatens the slave trade in Essos and thus the existence of the mercenary companies. He cannot fight for a ruler who will destroy them. Euron says that... That is why the Iron Bank wants the Ironborn on the Iron Throne. They know the true price, and with the Ironborn, they will turn a blind eye to slavery. And Euron doesn't want to be some queen's pet. She'll be his until he's tired of her. Strickland agrees to sail with Euron. I don't really have too much to comment on Theon's, you know, uh, showing up in Volantis. We obviously know he's going to be following Euron. And in those moments, he wouldn't probably know that Euron is there to get the Golden Company. So that conversation totally makes sense. If this is the route the show goes to send Theon in search of Euron, you know, pretty much going wherever he goes. I honestly think that the first time he sees Yara, he's going to jump the gun, so to speak, and try to go and rescue her. Maybe he'll fail and just escape again with his life, and that causes Yara to get physically, you know, wounded uh, That by having her tongue removed. Like, Euron is forced to watch... Uh, Euron has forced Theon to watch Yara get her tongue removed. That's something that Euron is known for in the books. Um, I see something more like that going down. Uh, as far as Euron's conversation with Harry Strickland, I hope they bring up that part about the Blackfire Rebellion and how the Golden Company was founded by, you know, a pretender for House Targaryen. I would totally love to see that happen. You know, we might even get a bit of a flashback. I know we won't, but I'm just saying I would love to hear someone talking about that. Um, as far as them saying, you know, about wanting to keep slave trade active in Essos and not just in Essos and also in Westeros too, because that means, you know, more money for the sell swords. That is definitely going to be the motivation of the only reason why the Golden Company would join Euron. Um, Euron, you know, at this point, 
I do think that he's planning on betraying Cersei. So that's just like common knowledge. Anyone who's watched the TV show can predict that that's the route Euron's going to go. He's not exactly a trustworthy dude. And if you guys remember in Season 7, during the, the Dragon Pit scene, when Daenerys arrived on Drogon, Euron got a huge dragon boner. So why would he still remain loyal to Cersei if Cersei's trying to rid the world of dragons? It only makes sense that the, you know, if this conversation is had the way that it is in this plot leak with the Golden Company, that they join Euron's side just for the simple fact that Daenerys is against slavery. She's the breaker of trains, and, you know, if she rules in Westeros, and eventually if she goes back to the Bay of Dragons in Essos, you know, they're, they're trying to get rid of slavery. Remember, Tyrion gave everyone seven years over there. Continuing on here, we have Melisandre from her point of view, also in Volantis with Theon and Euron. Theon is off ship and walking around the streets trying to find where Euron is gone. He is stopped by Melisandre, who asks who he is trying to save, his sister or himself. Theon answers his sister. Melisandre says that she sees him in the flames and what he must do. She has an offer for him, and she takes him into a temple. Kinvara appears and says that she has raised an army for the one who was chosen by the Lord of Light. Melisandre looks at a nearby flame uncomfortably. Okay, so, you know... Honestly, I did think that Melisandre would be going to Volantis. A lot of us did. We know that she said she had to go to Essos, but her ultimate, you know, her ultimate dream, kind of, is that she dies in a foreign land. So she'll be back to Westeros. So if that's the case, if she does go to Volantis, she's going to go and get the Fiery Hand. Which, if you want to know more about who the Fiery Hand, you can actually click right up here, and that'll take you to a video that I did a while back explaining who the Fiery Hand is and my theory pertaining to how that will affect Jon Snow in season eight. Um, as far as him, as, as far as her dialogue, you know, saying that she she sees him in in the flames, that's honestly Melisandre's go-to, and I would not be surprised if she's trying to seduce Theon. You know, even though he doesn't have a pecker, he does have king's blood in him. So it would not surprise me if we find Melisandre up to her old tricks, trying to seduce Theon, you know, only to find out that, hey, he doesn't have a pecker and you kind of just, you, you need his blood. It would be interesting to see if the leeches don't come out again. Now we are continuing on with Winterfell. Daenerys and crew prepare to enter the Great Hall. She briefly speaks to Jorah. He's upset about his niece. Daenerys offers to make him the head of House Mormont, but he refuses. He'd rather stay by her side, especially now. He looks suspiciously, suspiciously at Jon. Daenerys asks if he is jealous. He says no, but to be wary of those around her. <laughs> okay, Daenerys is flustered at this and says that everyone also speaks of how Eddard Stark was an honorable man and that Jon is just like him. She asks if he doesn't like Jon because of that. Jorah says he likes Jon and that he's a good man makes it all the more dangerous that he is so close to her when he may not yet have secured an alliance. A servant approaches them and leads them in. Daenerys and Jon walks into the Great Hall together. Upon entering, Sansa, Arya, and Bran are situated at the right of where Jon would sit. The servant leads them to the table and Daenerys is seated at the head of the table. The northern lords are upset by this, especially as Dothraki and Unsullied sit by them at the tables. It's not a feast, but there is bread and salt at each table and Sansa encourages them all to eat. Tyrion is sitting beside Daenerys and he tells her it is custom that this is the custom in Westeros. Daenerys is aware of this custom and Tyrion reminds her that the Starks take it more seriously than others considering. Daenerys asks what that means and Arya speaks up about her brother and mother all being killed by all being all their men being killed at the wedding. Varys says that is wrong and Missandei agrees. Daenerys gives her condolences with a smile but Arya says her family has been avenged here. Male Frey is dead. Varys mentions that he heard a curious tale, you know, kind of like basically what Arya did. Um, and he looks at Arya, but does not elaborate even when everyone is looking his way. Jon asks his siblings how they are. Arya is pleased to see him. Bran says he has something to tell him later about his journey beyond the wall. Yeah, I'm not. I'm sure that's not the only thing Bran has to tell him. Jon wavers and Sansa breaks in, telling him that his friend Samwell Tarly has arrived from the Weech. Reach, he asks where he is, and Sansa says he has been looking through what survived the burning of the library. She called for him, though, but the girl beyond the wall mentioned he went to see the dragons first. Daenerys turns to Tyrion. The girl from beyond the wall, I'm assuming you're referring to Gilly. Daenerys turns to Tyrion. Tyrion looks at his goblet of wine uncomfortably. Jon asks what's wrong, and Daenerys looks towards Jorah. Sansa senses something is amiss and looks towards Lyanna. Lyanna is seeing 
Seating at her chair, Sansa nods in her direction. Lyanna bites her lip, sighs, and stands up dramatically. She asks why the North should bend the knee to any foreign queen. The Starks look at Jon, and he stands up, declaring that he bent the knee because Daenerys can help save the North. That's what matters. Lyanna doesn't like this answer. She seems to be going off whatever plan Sansa has concocted because Sansa gives Lyanna a warning look, which Tyrion sees. Lyanna doesn't listen and says that it is convenient for the Dragon Queen that only she can save them when they have heard it was a dragon which brought down the wall. Daenerys frowns. Jon says that she saved him and his men and helped bring proof to the south so they'll have enough men to fight. Sansa interrupts them. She says whatever Cersei said, she lied because that's what she does. Now, that, that's probably this one part out of this entire Winterfell plot from this part of the plot league of episode two that is true. Sansa will definitely, you know, tell them if they try to be like, well, we've got an alliance with Cersei. Sansa will be the first one to interject herself and say, nope, she's a liar. Don't trust anything that cruel witch says. Daenerys asks what she means, and Sansa recounts of when she was a hostage under the Lannisters and remembers their cruelty. Jan Royce calls out that two of her hostage takers sit among them. Varus and Tyrion look uncomfortable. Sansa says it is in the past, but she appears unhappy about it. Arya interrupts and asks what Daenerys planned to do to prove herself worthy of being the North's queen. Daenerys says she will march beside the North in their war. Arya corrects her that it is her war too. Bran, who has been quiet until now, says she will fight for them. She must if she remembers the Undying. This makes Daenerys uncomfortable and she asks how he knows what happened in Karth, but Bran isn't giving her the opportunity to, to answer. For some reason, Sam runs into the Great Hall holding the same raven from before saying that a small army of White Walkers have been seen outside the Dreadfort. Jon says it is the strongest fortress in the north after Winterfell was raised. If they could defeat some of the White Walkers there, it could help later and prove to the North that they could be beaten. Sansa turns to Daenerys and asks if she will march for the North. Tyrion begins to speak, saying that they just arrived, but Daenerys interrupts and said they will leave tomorrow with the entire army. She stands up and gives a speech about how she is their queen, and they will fight together. Uh, you know, I have a lot of issues with a lot of the lines of dialogues from that last part. You know, and this is this, I guess, episode two and episode one are going to be heavily Winterfell focused. Um, honestly, the main thing that's calling my attention is the fact that everyone keeps looking at everybody. That's not exactly keeping along with the theme of Game of Thrones. Now, they are never, you know, known to shy away from stuff like awkward scenes. That's totally along with the theme of Game of Thrones, but to think that there's just going to be this entire scene where Lyanna's being pissy and she's looking at everyone, like, that's just not going to happen. There's no time for that. Now, I totally see Arya and Sansa, you know, asking Daenerys, more so Arya. I think Arya is going to be completely void of manners, and I think that that's going to end up working for her and Daenerys' relationship in the long run because I made a prediction that Daenerys and Arya will likely become extremely close. It just makes sense that Arya loves Jon. She wants him to be happy. She will probably see how happy they are together, and, you know, she'll enjoy Daenerys for that, but that's not going to say that she won't give her a hard time at first. I totally see Arya saying, hey, what, you know, how how are you going to provide for us? Like, yeah, it's convenient to say that, you know, you're here, and you're here to help us, but it's not just our war. It's your war as well, so what's going to happen when this war is over? Are you going to try to rule the north, or are you going to go back down south to King's Landing? I honestly don't think anyone in the north would have a problem with that if that's what Daenerys plans on doing. Um, as far as Sansa having some sort of scheme and some like major plan, uh, that that kind of fits along with the theme of it. Um, I don't know if you know Lyanna would sort of like ruin that plan. I just I just I don't not a big fan of that. Um, I'm not a big fan of all of like the character choice that the this the writer of this plot leak is taking for Lyanna. Like they're honestly they're making her seem like a bit of a nuisance. Like. I do remember that in season seven, when we were watching, you know, when John was deciding to go and go ride south and basically go and get Daenerys and see if she can come and help them. Uh, Lyanna did have a lot of objectifications for that. Like she was totally against that 100%. Um, and that is going to continue in, in the season eight. I just don't know if she's going to be, you know, quite the way that they're making her out to seem like this. As far as her reactions towards Jorah, she's definitely going to be pissed at Jorah, and she probably will pretend that she doesn't know him. Um, I don't think that Daenerys is going to proposition to Jorah to say, hey, I can make you head of the household, although she might. Um, I don't know if Jorah is going to have like an attitude because, I, honestly, if she do, if Daenerys does kind of mention that to him, I definitely think that Jorah, he's at the point where he realizes that he doesn't deserve you know, House Mormont, and he honestly doesn't even want it, so I'm pretty sure if that was even, if that did even happen, he would immediately turn it down. But anyway, let's continue on. We're still in Winterfell, and these scenes take place in the evening time. Sansa is waking 
walking the halls, overlooking the yard when she's joined by Tyrion. He says that she has grown into a beautiful young woman. She responds that she is glad to see him and sorry for what was said in the Great Hall. Tyrion warns that he heard other things were said in the Great Hall before they arrived. Sansa is nervous, but Tyrion says not to worry. He knows she turned down the offer, but he asks her what she thinks of her brother taking the crown. Sansa admits she felt as if the Northern Lords did not appreciate her sacrifice to secure the veil, but she ple she's pleased her family is home or what's left of it. They look over Daenerys' soldiers. Sansa tells him she will not leave Winterfell again for any reason. Their marriage is over. Tyrion says he guessed as much for who could love a dwarf and awkwardly smiled. Sansa frowns and says she doesn't hate him and that she doesn't know if she will ever marry again. Tyrion asks why. After all, she's the heir to Winterfell. Sansa says she didn't think about it that way. She is the lady of Winterfell, but Jon is, or was, rather, the king, and his children will rule over Winterfell. Then she mentions that Littlefinger suggested a match between Jon and Daenerys as they are both young and unmarried and the North needs an alliance to fight the dead and the living, Sansa asks if she thinks it's possible. Tyrion admits that something may have happened between them. <laughs> Sansa is unhappy with this, but says it would make it easier, even if it would be harder for the North to accept it first. Varys approaches Tyrion, seeming to want to lighten the mood, asks where Littlefinger is, since he heard he had pledged you know, his cause to this. Sansa says that she and her siblings killed him in the Great Hall for his crimes against her family and leaves that scene, shocking Varys and Tyrion. Now, honestly, this is kind of, it's almost like they're playing into the fan fiction where everyone's like, okay, Tyrion and Sansa were technically married. Tyrion is not a terrible person at all. Um, he definitely cared for Sansa. Sansa, you know, is kind of open-minded to the idea that she's not going to judge someone. If she loves them, she loves them. So, you know, we all were sitting here theorizing that, oh man, Tyrion's going to be with, back with Sansa. Tyrion is upset that Daenerys is with Jon Tyrion was in love with Daenerys. Tyrion has had his heart broken, you know, multiple times. Sansa is kind of on that same boat, except for she hasn't. She kind of had her heart broken with Joffrey. She thought he was this one thing, and he was the complete total opposite of it. And you can say she had more than her heart broken with that. But, you know, we all kind of wanted that to happen, and it kind of seems like this plot leak is just playing off of that. I don't think that Tyrion and Sansa are going to have a conversation where he's like, oh, well, you know, I figured you wouldn't want to marry. Like, basically, the way that that dialogue is written, it's almost like Tyrion is like, playing that that like victim card like oh who would want to marry a dwarf anyway i don't think it's going to go down like that i think if anything someone else is going to bring it up and you know like weren't you two married and then you know it'll be brought up about that um i'm not gonna sit here and say that sansa's dialogue wasn't true with her character i definitely think that that's you know something that she could say is basically she's not ready she she probably will never get married again and since she's keeping in theme with she wants john to remain king she definitely would respond with well his children should, you know, remain to rule over Winterfell. I do think that, uh, you know, Tyrion might try to say something about, well, technically you're the, and that that will maybe would remind her a little bit of Littlefinger, and then that's when Littlefinger will get brought up. Like I think that will be something that she brings up herself as sort of like bragging rights, because we do know that Varus is a manipulator. Tyrion is is a clever fellow, which you know could be conceived as manipulating. He still is a Lannister, and I know that Sansa trusts Tyrion, but it's not going to be 100%. So the fact that you know you have these two connivers having a conversation with Sansa, and Sansa is not the one who brings up, hey, yeah, we killed Littlefinger. It just doesn't seem very natural. Um, you guys, let me know what you think about this this conversation between Tyrion and Sansa. You think this is just straight, you know, one of the parts where it's just straight fan fiction? Or do you think you could see this conversation going down in a similar way that this supposed plot leak is claiming? This is continuing on at Winterfell. Like I said, a majority of this episode will take place at Winterfell, according to this plot leak. Um, this is at nighttime. In a private room, Jon reunites with Arya and Bran by the fire. He and Bran have a tender reunion, but Jon has somewhat of an awkward reunion with Bran and is confused why he is the Three-Eyed Raven now. Sansa enters the room. Arya wants to know why Jon bent the knee. Jon said he had to, as it was the only way to secure an alliance with Daenerys, and she would have marched north anyway. He says they can't beat her dragons. Arya offers to try. So <laughs> okay, yeah. Sansa tells her not to do that. Bran says they need the dragons. Sansa takes a deep breath and asks if he is considering a long-lasting alliance. Jon asks what she means. Sansa pulls at, him, at the hem of her sleeve and suggests marriage. Jon asks why she would suggest that. Sansa says it's the smart thing to do. Arya doesn't like this. She doesn't want Jon to go away. Everyone is finally back at Winterfell, and Sansa says she doesn't want anyone to leave ever again. But what choice do they have? Okay, so, oh man, can't wait to dissect this part. Arya leaves the room anger, 
like in angry um the person who wrote this plot leak is not writing complete sentences so when you hear me break up and fumble with words it's literally the plot leak's fault is because i'm trying to read this fluently and it just doesn't flow fluently anyway sanda tells john that they that she heard from Tyrion, there was something between daenerys and him perhaps they could announce a marriage on their return john says he's done what is necessary to protect the North? Sansa says she knows, but the Northerners are too proud to bend the knee again. Like, not every three words need to include a period, bro. Like, these short sentences. Oh, my God. A royal marriage would give the North the power if Daenerys took back the throne and their children could unite Westeros, though at least one would need to bear the Stark name for the North to agree to it. John tells her there will be no children. Daenerys said she was unable to. Sansa is surprised by this, but she says that's unlikely. What queen would want to rule if she would have no heirs? Sansa leaves the room, and John and Bran are left alone. Bran says he has something to tell John and to call for Sam. John is confused, but Bran says it's necessary that she that he is there to confirm what he's about to say oh man so let's dive into that now first of all this is kind of like a soap opera scene we have all of the starks in a room together and honestly that is going to happen at some point in game of thrones season eight like you know the more we get towards the end of this episode two plot leak the more it's like okay well this person was obviously paying attention to the show and a lot of this stuff that goes down will happen just not the way this plot leak describes but it will happen because this is the way that the show is naturally going like we i cannot wait to have all the starks in the same room um the dialogue is going to be pretty similar to what they say happens here like they're going to be asking john like i can totally see sansa playing the role of oh i know something but I'm not going to tell you how much I know. So suggesting Maris to John, John being curious about why she would even suggest that because him and Daenerys obviously haven't let let everyone know that they're together yet. He would want to know, hey, why is that? Um, as far as Arya being the one who's completely opposed to John getting married, I don't think so. I think that's going to be Sansa's role. I think Arya is going to have to convince Sansa that you know it's the best for the kingdom. Um, it would fit along if Sansa's the one to like agree and you know push John into the marriage. It would fit along with her growth as a character and wanting to become like you know a rightful minded heir. I just don't know, you know, I, I just don't think Arya is going to be that opposed to it the way that they're claiming it. Um, as far as Bran wanting everyone to leave the room and it, you know, just being him and John there and then having Sam, another person John Snow trusts, it's definitely going to go down that way. And this is probably the only thing this plot leak has gotten 100% correct is that Bran will have to tell John and John will need someone else in there like Sam will to kind of ice everything over. Like, no, he's not lying. He's the truth. We both saw it. I also have this marriage record of your two parents. Okay, so these next few parts take place outside of Winterfell. First up is the Red Keep. Cersei is sleeping in her room having a nightmare. She's remembering Maggie, the frog's prophecy, and when she wakes, she finds herself in a sweat and feeling a lot of pain. She hears drums. The city is under attack. Cersei runs over to the window with a hand on her belly expecting Daenerys, but instead sees Euron and the Golden Company ships attacking. She's been betrayed. Kyburn enters the room and says that this can ruin everything. One wrong move by either side and the entire city could go up in flames. Cersei says that that's exactly what is supposed to happen, but it's too soon. She asks if they can put a stop to it. Kyburn says they can't. They most must go somewhere where it's safe. Now, honestly... This is probably going to go down just like that. Like, I knew that somehow either the Golden Company was going to betray Euron and Cersei and go and join Daenerys' side because it is mentioned early on in the television show that Jorah is actually, you know, he was a sellsword with the Golden Company for many years before he came and worked for Daenerys' brother. So, it's totally possible that the Golden Company are going to betray one way and the fact that, you know, they want to help Euron capture King's Landing so that he can proposition it to, you know, get... The Dragon Queen, basically, I, I definitely see this going to happen. And honestly, it would be even more amazing for Cersei to get her just desserts and to not expect it. You know, not expect who it's coming from. Like, she knows that if she's going to die, it's going to likely be, you know, by the hands of Jon or Daenerys. But the fact that it's coming from Euron, the fact that it's coming from within, is pretty amazing. And honestly, if Euron chokes her, that whole Valonqar prophecy kind of works. Because technically, Euron is Balon's younger brother. So, you know, you have that. Then in Blackwater Bay, Euron leads the assault on King's Landing, being met by a few ships. But, just as he's about to disembark and row to the shore, ships bearing the Lord of Light appear and begin to fire at the Ironborn and the Golden Company. Not expecting to be met at sea, Euron realizes his army is floundering. 
but he's determined to fight back. He's surprised when he encounters Theon's ships and they end up in a duel. However, Theon can't defeat him, so he uses the opportunity to kick him into the water and seek out Yara. He fights through Lesser Ironborn until he comes upon Euron, beaten down, but she says she's ready to fight, and Theon helps her out of chains. She is glad he came back for her. She wasn't sure he or anyone would. Theon apologizes for not coming sooner, but Yara isn't certain he can defeat Euron and the mercenaries. Theon says he has an army. She's confused, but they make it onto the ship, and they watch as the Golden Company appear to be fleeing for the sure to avoid a sea battle they can't win. Unfortunately, this requires fighting their way in, and a wrong fiery arrow causes an entire section of the ship to go up in flames. They watch in all. Elsewhere, the followers of the Lord of Light see a prayer. Kinvara says this is a scene, but Melisandre is frowning. Kinvara asks why she looks so displeased when this is what she wanted. Melisandre admits that she isn't what she wants anymore. The fires across the city getting bigger, and Euron pulls himself out of the water. So, I could totally see, you know, a lot of this happening. I don't, I definitely don't think that Theon is going to, ally himself with the fiery hand and with Kinvar and Melisandre like he would if they all run into each other but I don't think Theon is gonna have to follow him all the way to Volantis I think he's going to you know make his moves before he meets up with the Golden Company because there's less soldiers that he would technically have to fight so that whole like fiery hand uh Theon alliance with Melisandre that's all a load of croc hawk to it. um as far as Theon the way that he rescues Yara, totally is going to go down that way. Theon and Euron are going to square off. You know, we kind of had the part one of that last season in episode two where Theon attacked some of Daenerys' ships at sea. And we had that duel where Theon was thrown into the sea. So with Game of Thrones being, you know, history and repeating itself, I could see something similar happening where Theon is the one to throw Euron into the ocean. That would be, you know, kind of poetic. Uh, then in the Red Keep in the cellars, Cersei and Kyburn are waiting um, for an end to the fighting. She asks if they are safe down here because it feels as if the entire castle is shaking. Kyburn says it's the city burning down. Cersei doubles over in pain. Then back to Blackwater Bay. The fires get more intense across the city and the debris is causing the ships to catch fire. Death is everywhere. By sea, by ship, and due to the catastrophic flames. Theon and Yara arrive back on their ship. Theon asks Melisandre if she saw this in the flames, all those people dying. He has already done so much. All he wanted to do was save his sister. Mel Melisandre told him he did that. Euron comes onto the ship looking crazed. Kinvara says she sees a darkness in him. Well, duh, it's Euron and Greyjoy. Yara shies away, and Theon sees his sister's fear. He's enraged. Theon and Euron duel, but Theon doesn't have the upper hand, even with his fancy northern fighting skills. That's funny, because I could totally see Euron saying, Oh, you've gotten good at fighting with your fancy northern fighting skills. And when Euron breaks through and threatens to kill Yara, Theon grabs a bow and arrow from an archer and shoots an arrow into Euron's heart. Now, Theon is known to be the best archer um, pretty much in Westeros, so I can totally see that coming back around you know they kind of show it on the show a little bit in the earlier seasons we see th we see theon naturally very natural with a bow and arrow so if he kills you on this way that would be awesome because he's using what he's good at to, to to overcome someone as great as an enemy as you theon and yara are reunited but now the entire city is up in flames even the red keep melisandre tells them this is the purest way to die is by fire theon says he he isn't dying today, and him and Yara take command of the ships as flames shoot across the sky. Then in the Red Keep, the castle shakes again, and Cersei looks up around at the dragons. Kyburn says the Red Keep must be on fire, and while the sellers don't have any wildfire, he cannot promise what will happen. They were supposed to leave by sea. Cersei holds her stomach, and we see the halls of the Red Keep on flint in flames she starts bleeding and passes out as the rest of the city is destroyed so i think what they're hinting at there is that cersei is in the middle of having a miscarriage brought on by all the stress of the raging battle outside then back in the blackwater bay theon and yara watch the destruction of king's landing by fire now um spoiler alert i know this should have been said at the beginning of this video but this part might actually go down the way it is um we were told about a month back, which I actually did a video on it. You can click right up here. Um, it was for spoilers that there was a set for a part of King's Landing that was being built that was going to be put on fire. You can click that link right up there, and that'll take you to that video if you want to know more about that. But the fact that King's Landing is burning, uh, that's definitely going to happen, whether it's from Daenerys' dragons or from this insane battle. Uh, King's Landing will definitely be burning next season. I honestly thought that it could be the Night King flying down on his dragon 
to make it so that the northerners have nowhere to escape like let's say he has part of his army up north fighting Daenerys and Jon and then he you know take hops on his dragon and flies down south and burns King's Landing just to give us that just desserts for Cersei and also to make it so that they have nowhere south to run you know what I mean um and he also may need to replenish his ranks and killing all of the citizens of King's Landing and adding millions more to his army is a good way to do so but continuing on with the plot leak we are coming into the climax of the episode, like the, the, the closing part. Okay, so this is back at Winterfell, and this is again at nighttime. John and Bran meet Sam in the Godswood. Bran touches the tree and says he can see things. He is the three eyed raven. John doesn't know what that means. Bran recounts things John has done, which nobody but John could have known. Bran says he saw everything and still sees everything. Now, there's a part in the plot leak earlier where Bran does this to Daenerys with the part of the house, you know, the house of the undying and her vision there, and how she walked into. The King's Landing throne room, the Red Keep, and just saw everything covered in ashes or snow. I'll say that for a debate for another time. You guys let me know down below if you think that's ashes or snow. But Bran continuing on his whole, I know what you did last summer, to his whole spiel, that's definitely going to happen. And he's definitely going to do it to John and Daenerys for sure. Like, that's just, there's, it's not, you know, special that the plot leak is saying this because we all knew that he was going to do this. He did it to every single character he ran into. That's a main character on the TV show. But anyway... He says sometimes he thinks he can even see what is going to happen in the future, but that's not what is important. He tells John what is important with, and that's what's ha what happened in the past. John asks what he means. Bran says he knows who his mother is. Sam says he can prove it legally and takes out the note. John isn't sure what he wants to know after this time. She must be dead by now. He doesn't know what it matters, like why it even matters. He's still Eddard Stark's son. Remember, when, I, when my words get really chopped up and don't seem fluent like they are now, that's because the plot leak is written by someone who doesn't understand basic punctuation and how to make a complete sentence as opposed to several incomplete sentences. Anyway, John says he doesn't believe that. Um, John says he doesn't believe that he isn't Eddard Stark's son. Like, John basically thinks that Ned is still his father. So Bran decides to tell him how it happened from the beginning about how he is the son of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark, the true heir to the Iron Throne. Dragons begin shrieking. Scene changes to Daenerys in the crypts. She is standing between Lyanna and Eddard. Varys approaches her. Daenerys says she always expected to avenge her family by killing Robert Baratheon and Eddard Stark, but both died before she reached Westeros. She looks at Eddard Stark and says she heard he was a kind man from almost everyone but her brother. Varus concedes he was. Then she looks at Lyanna Stark. Little does she know that Ed Ned was one of the only ones who wanted to save her. Like Robert was always trying to kill her, and Ned was like, No, she's just a tile, you know, across the narrow sea. We don't need to do it. Anyway, Daenerys asks what happened to call the Targaryen to start a war over one Stark woman. If Rhaegar had met Lyanna, Daenerys would have grown up in Westeros. Varus Asked himself that every day. It made no sense what happened. He says the entire story is a fabrication as far as he knew. Rhaegar and Lyanna loved each other and he did not kidnap her. Daenerys says Varus was serving her father when it happened. How could he not know? Varus says that Rhaegar went to marry Lyanna in secret to avoid the Mad King and, and Dorne's like, anger. But before her family could be told, someone had said that she had been forcibly taken and sent you know, the Starks a letter. Daenerys asks who. Varus says he has no idea. A lot of people tend to think that Littlefinger was the one who sent that letter to the Starks. Bran touches the heart tree, and he tells Jon it all began at Harrenhal. In his vision, the first thing Bran sees is a young Lyanna who has arrived at the tourney with her family. Eddard and Lyanna's betrothed have not yet arrived. Catelyn meets her betrothed, Brandon Stark, and they walk along. She talks excitedly about their marriage, and she sees a young boy ahead and calls him out by his name. Peter. So if this, you know, that's pretty much where the episode wraps up. But if this is the case, we'll be getting the Turn and Harrenhal flashback where, you know, you have the Blue Winter Rose, that scene where Rhaegar wins the tournament at Harrenhal and he crowns Lyanna, the queen of love and beauty, and gives her a crown of Blue Winter Roses as opposed to his wife. That's where, honestly, the crap hit the fan for Rest Rose. So the proverbial crap hit the proverbial fan. Like, it, it's it's pretty much where everything, the, the fabric of reality, started to break down. Like, that's where it all started. So, I definitely think that Bran is going to, like I had mentioned, pull his, I know what you did last summer to everyone. Um, as far as him explaining to Jon Snow and then Jon not believing, believing that Jon saying, no, I'm, I'm Ned's son. 
Uh, that's just not in in character with Jon Snow. He's been told his whole life, even though Ned raised him as one of his own sons, he's been a bastard. He's been a Snow. So for for Jon to just be like, but but I'm Ed's son. No, he's he's known his entire life that he's not Ned Stark's son. Like he might. Ned might have treated him like he was, but he's known deep down that something's not right. Something doesn't fit there. It just makes sense in the novels. He feels like he's never a Stark. But I would love to see this Tony Harrenhal flashback. Honestly, I kind of like this part of the plot leak, so I'm not going to bash it too much. I kind of wish that a lot of the stuff that is is being listed in that section of the plot leak goes down the way it is. So I'm going to leave this one up, you know, for the bashing part of it, up to you guys. You guys let me know down in the comment section if you think Jon Snow's true lineage reveal is going to go down this way. This has been a super special long video i want to thank everyone so so much for watching if you could please slap a like on this video the like goal will be 200 if you want to enter into that contest go ahead and do so you have a few more hours to do so just click on that gleam.io link down below and make sure you enter into the contest every single way to sundown to make sure you win one of these amazing top five prizes super special thank you to terio and Mario, they are the executive producers for this video. And without them, this kind of content would not be possible. And also, super special thank you to every single one of my patrons over at Patreon.com. My name's Mark. I want to thank you again so, so much for watching. This has been Sir Hunts Reviews.